Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. This is going to be on gastric gist tumors. And you might say, gee, I hardly see any gist tumors. Well, gist tumors are increasing in frequency over the past several decades, and we see lots of them at Hopkins, and they're often confused with other pathologies. And I thought I would do over the next couple talks is tell you everything you need to know about gastric gist tumors and then look carefully at a range of different appearances. So I'm going to show you lots of cases, then I'm going to show you lots of pitfalls, and we'll go from there. So let's get started. Now some of the basic facts. Gastric gist tumors are the most common GI tract mesenchymal tumor. Most of these occur in the stomach. Almost two-thirds of these occur in the stomach. We also see lots of them, and we've spoken about that, in the small bowel. But they can occur anywhere from the esophagus to the anal region. The majority are benign, but about a third of them can be aggressive. They arise from the interstitial cells of cagel and the submucosa. They're kind of specific in terms of the pathology. They're immunoreactive to CKIT and DOG-1 and immunohistologic examinations. And this helps differentiate them from other mesenchymal tumors. About 5% of them do not show CKIT reactivity, so that's pretty uncommon. They express a tyrosine kinase growth factor receptor that can be targeted for treatment, and that is a typical Gleevec treatment. This article by Anderson, mesenchymal tumors arise from mesenchymal cells in the gastric wall and include gist tumors, non-gist tumors, lipomas, lyomyomas, schwannomas, and glomus tumors. Gist are the most common subtype of mesenchymal tumors and can be either benign or aggressive. A well-circumscribed gastric mass with its epicenter in the submucosa of the stomach and absence of perigastric lymphadenopathy favors a benign gist tumor, but surely it favors a gist tumor. So what are the CT findings of gist tumors? They can occur anywhere in the stomach, but they're commonly in the body or the gastric antrum region. The benign ones are well-circumscribed, endophytic or exophytic. They can be bilobed. You can see ulcerations when they get larger than several centimeters. I haven't seen all that many ulcerate, but when they ulcerate, they can also present with bleeding. We talk about aggressive being over five centimeters. Then you're more likely to see necrosis or hemorrhage. These lesions can occasionally have calcifications, and I'll show you some of those. We typically think about calcifications as in lyomyomas, but just tumors can have calcifications. We can see lymphadenopathy with or without metastasis, though I have to admit in most gist tumors, even very large ones, I don't see adenopathy. When these tumors are aggressive, they can invade locally, they can go to omentum, they can go to mesentery. When I try to think about gist tumors on a CT perspective, I think about those that are intraluminal versus extraluminal. The majority are extraluminal, and often the largest lesions are the extraluminal ones, which is not surprising. They can have homogeneous enhancement or heterogeneous enhancement. And the larger they get, the more likely you are to see central necrosis. One of the challenges with gist tumors, while they're often misdiagnosed, if you haven't seen a lot of them, they kind of seem to abut the stomach and you get the feeling they're arising from somewhere else, maybe the pancreas, maybe the retroperitoneum, maybe the adrenal. So it's often one of the mistakes in diagnosis, and I'll show you by looking at a bunch of these how you don't make the mistake. In this article by Scala on gist tumors, all patterns of enhancement on contrast CT can be seen with gist tumors, hypoenhancing, isoenhancing, and hyperenhancing tumors. I will admit in my experience, and this is true also in the small bowel, the smaller tumors are the ones that are more hypervascular. The larger the tumor gets, the less vascular the lesions tend to be. Most of the cases we see are abdominal pain. Other times, obstruction and GI bleeding can be the cause. Bleeding can take the form of a slow intraluminal GI bleed or even massive intraperitoneal bleeding secondary to rupture of the tumor. Now, in theory, gist tumors can rupture, but I will admit I've only seen just a handful of that ever happening. Now, the vast majority of gist tumors are sporadic, but they can occur with certain syndromes, and I'll cover this at the end, but syndromes like neurofibromatosis 1, carne striatus syndrome, 
which has GIST tumors and paragangliomas, Carney's triad syndrome, which consists of GIST tumors, pulmonary chondromas, and paragangliomas, and then, of course, familiar GIST tumors. Those syndromes are really good um, examples of things you can quiz people on, and really, uh, they may not know the answer. Similarly, in this article by Scala, GIST are the most common form of sarcoma, and so as such, GIST can never really be classified as benign. One of the things we notice on path reports, particularly on lesions under 5 centimeters, they'll say the lesion looks benign, but it would need to be followed, and the patient needs to be followed because they eventually can become malignant. Most patients have localized disease, but about 11.4% have regional and distant metastasis at time of presentation. Recurrences have been reported up to 30 years after initial diagnosis and resection. Metastasis during initial presentation or after resection most commonly involve the liver and peritoneal surface due to GIST tendency for local invasion. And I'll show you some examples as well. In terms of clinical presentations, it's very, very variable. Exophytic lesions are often very large at presentations. Again, they may present with ulcerations. Many of the times we just have them present with some fullness or some pain. Uh, the most common symptoms are usually nonspecific, pain, nausea, weight loss, and obstruction. And again, um, rupture can occur, but to me, this is a really rare finding. Now, there are many things that can mimic GIST tumors, and we'll cover some of those as well later on in the lecture. On the three centimeters, lyomyomas, gastric polyps, METs, and ectopic pancreas, though that's usually more vascular, so usually can distinguish it. Gastric METs, we are seeing more. We're seeing from melanoma. We're seeing from renal cell carcinoma. But surely with the renal cell, they're usually more vascular than typical GIST tumors, but you never know. And over 5 centimeters, you can't confuse it with a large gastric adenocarcinoma, extra gastric masses simulating a GIST tumor, whether they arise in pancreas or spleen or adrenal. And I'll show you some really cool examples of hemangiomas that are exophytic that have been confused with GIST tumors. Now, there's also questions to answer because when we quiz people on GIST tumors, these are the things they often don't think about. Do GIST tumors calcify? The answer is yes. Do they bleed? The answer is yes. Do they metastasize? The answer is yes. And are they always solitary or they can they be multiple? I would say invariably they're solitary, and I have seen one or two cases where they're multiple. Now, if you want to read about treatment, uh, the NIH, the NCI, is really a good place to look. But let me just cover some of the basic theories of how we do things. Now, treatment. Surgery is typically the initial therapy for the following types of patients. Those with primary GIST tumors who do not have evidence of metastasis. Those with tumors that are technically resectable if the risks of morbidity are acceptable. In the surgical treatment of GIST, the goal is complete resection with an intact pseudocapsule and negative microscopic margins. Theoretically, you can do this laparoscopically. Most of the time, they're going to do open procedures, particularly when the tumors are large. Because lymph node metastasis are rare with GIST tumors, lymphadenopathy of clinically uninvolved nodes is not necessary in most cases. Now, typically, the question is, what about small tumors? Everyone would typically say that GIST above 2 centimeters should be resected. And smaller than 2 centimeters is somewhat controversial. The question about watchful waiting and perhaps adjuvant uh, imitinib therapy would be considered. In general, just tumors 5CM is smaller in size, may be removed by laparoscopic wedge resection. And because of the fact that they rarely involve nodes, nodal dissection is not necessary. And when that's the case, laparoscopic works very well. When lesions get larger, you have to do it open. And also the concern for fragile pseudocapsules. And again, then you worry about peritoneal uh, dissemination. So when lesions get larger, it's going to be an open procedure. In terms of chemotherapy, before targeted uh, molecular therapy came along, 
Uh, conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy was essentially futile. Um, the extreme resistance of just the chemotherapy, there's a number of different thought processes, but standard chemotherapy has no role in the primary therapy of just tumors. On the other hand, tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, which is uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we typically think about Gleevec. It's the first-line treatment for unresectable metastatic or recurrent GIST tumors. Although complete responses are rare, a large majority of patients uh, will have a pretty good response. Median survival rates have gone from less than two years to more than five years since the institution of therapy. Also, the question about using uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors to reduce tumor volume may be useful in patients with large primary GIST tumors that can't be removed because of their size without the risk of unnecessary morbidity. Um, people are also studying whether or not if your tumor is resectable, perhaps getting Gleevec will um, prevent recurrences. So again, Gleevec is the key finding. Again, the importance of being able to recognize the tumor and really then define the best therapy. Now, when we look at just tumors, there's several things we're gonna look at. Intraluminal versus extraluminal. Intraluminal is less common. Whether they're over or under 5 cm, again, the aggressiveness will be defined by this. The vascularity, our experience, the smaller the tumor, the more vascular. Calcification is rare, but does occur. And then extra gastric spread is rare, but does occur as well. So simple lesions. Here's a two centimeter homogeneous, smooth mass in the stomach classic gist tumor. Yes, you could think about a lion myoma. This two centimeter lesion, should you resect it or not, there's a lot of argument. This was resected laparoscopically. You can see it very nicely here as well, showing you the images really nicely, very nice, smooth tumor, nicely defined. Another example here, where there's a small tumor, this one appears to be exophytic. There it is with the calcification. Surely you could think about a uh, possible lyomyoma. It looks benign, right? It's small. You potentially can follow those. You can see it again on these images. And these smaller gist tumors are typically incidental findings. Here's another one that looks similar to the last one, but it's larger. Here is an exophytic lesion under five centimeters. There it is, little faint calcification, mild vascularity in the lesion, but you can see it's exophytic coming off the greater curvature. Here's a few more views of that. You can see that it has some vascularity compared to the look of the patient's liver. Another example here, another just tumor. Here, fairly homogeneous, not very vascular. Again, the five centimeter range, it's exophytic. You see it particularly nicely on the coronal views. I do find coronal views and at times sagittal views in 3D helpful in recognizing these tumors. And just that exophytic appearance makes it very easy. Another example here, look at that mass coming off the region of the greater curvature, really high up. Very nice appearance. And here it is in cinematic rendering. I have been looking at cinematic rendering texture mapping in just tumors. You can see very nicely the homogeneous enhancement. Again, when I change the texture, you can see the texture of the lesion. And again, we are looking at texture for determining specifically tumor types. And perhaps it can be valuable in uh, predicting outcome. Just a few more images. You also very nicely here see the cinematic rendering showing you the vessels and the small bowel. And here it is side by side. Nice example. Smooth muscle tumor, gist. There it is right there as well on the cinematic. And again, this was an incidental finding. So it's not uncommon for us to pick up these smaller gist tumors when the patients are asymptomatic. Again, this is one which is not only endophytic in the lumen, but also exophytic. And so it's not uncommon to see this appearance. Sometimes these are the ones that ulcerate on the endoluminal component. So when I talk about gist tumors, we talk about in the lumen or exophytic, but there are some that bridge and are on both ends of the thing. 
Here it is again showing you the lesion nicely. And there it is on the sagittal view, just a really nice example with cinematic rendering. Here's another example. Now, I mentioned about incidental. This is a patient who has pancreatic cancer that also has this gastric mass, which is for the most part exophytic. Again, you could see it there. There's also an intraluminal component, nicely submucosal. So incidental just tumors, here it is again with volume rendering, nice appearance here and here as well. And here it is, same patient, again, cinematic rendering and classic volume rendering, really nicely showing you the lesion. Here's a few more images of that. Again, with cinematic rendering, with good gastric distension with water, you really get a nice look at the gastric folds. And again, here's a few more images. And just showing you how you can really uh, adjust the uh, windowing and centering on cinematic to get the best look of these tumors. So just a really nice example. And you can see I really like this case, again, showing you the multiple different views that really are available to you. And here's one more set of views. Again, in terms of looking at the lesion, uh, whether it's intraluminal or extraluminal, that alone is not going to say whether something's malignant. Uh, the ones that are intraluminal are more likely to bleed. But again, size becomes the critical factor. And again, here's just another look at one of these lesions. Now, I mentioned the cavivascular. This patient presented with GI bleeding. There was a mass in the stomach. You could think about carcinoma or lymphoma, but they usually don't bleed or enhance quite the same when they do bleed. Uh, lymphoma is more infiltrating. You could think about other tumors of the stomach. But this is a very nice example of a vascular lesion in the antrum. And this was a gist tumor. You can see a clip there. The uh, endoscopist went in and uh, clipped an area of bleeding. So again, uh, I mentioned about the fact and most of the cases I showed you are relatively homogeneous and not vascular. This is a nice example of a gist tumor in the antrum of the stomach that was very vascular. And here is the same lesion looking at cinematic rendering. And again, very nicely here, you can see the ulceration. So in terms of lesion size, this is not the largest lesion that you've ever seen or I've shown you so far. This is three centimeter range. But often the small lesions as well as the large lesions can ulcerate and they can bleed. So just a really nice example. And again, a range of images. So when you're thinking about vascular gastric masses, Things we think about at METS, like renal cell, we think about glomus tumors, uh, we think about metastatic melanoma, uh, we talk about ectopic pancreatic rest. Typically, adenocarcinoma is hypovascular, lymphoma is hypovascular, and linitis plastica is hypovascular. And again, here's very nicely showing you that lesion. And again, we can accentuate the texture and the vascularity on the cinematic rendering. Now let's look at larger gastric tumors. Now the largest lesions are gonna be the ones that are exophytic. You can see large lesions that are intraluminal. Occasionally you can see large lesions that are both extra and intraluminal, but the largest ones are the extraluminal lesions. So let's review them, but before we do, let's stop right here and we'll get started again in a couple minutes. See you in a moment, thanks. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.